This was the last day I was with them in the free world. With each incarceration, a family serves a sentence. Before the separation, she was my best friend. When she came home, as happy as I was, my soul was just exhausted. It's bittersweet. Looking at my kids kind of reminds me of where my life could have been. Commuted, a special edition of Afropop and America Reframe, directed by Nayla Jefferson and produced in collaboration with Danielle Metz. First entering prison, I was only 26 years old when the door closed on me. It was like a big freezer door, just go boom. That really shattered my heart. But I kept telling myself that freedom is a state of mind. <laughs> I think about what my life was like and imagine what it could have been. You don't want to ever lose touch with the outside world, sweetheart. Well, what you gonna do? You believe stuff so much, it really come true. Oh, yes, daddy. You remember that, daddy? We never knew anything. We never knew. Same story, over and over and over and over and over. How people gonna remember you? You got your children to live for. Mom, I'm not a kid anymore. This is supposed to be a forever thing. Lord have mercy, Jesus, because we had some good times, though. Mama. My name is Danielle Benoit Metz. I was sentenced to three life sentences plus 20 years as a first time nonviolent offender. My kids were three and seven at the time. Year after year, we pray the same prayer. Mama gonna come home and it's gonna be like it used to be when I come home. This was 1993, right before I got arrested. Me, with my son and my daughter, the last day I was with them in the free world. And I told them, I said, well, I'm not coming with you guys. And you can see she was pouting and he was pouting. And when I told them get in the car, both of them were screaming. I want my mama, I want my mama. They were yelling so loud, God, I couldn't even look back. Because if I would have looked back, I would have said, no, just let them stay. The marshals, they came. When they were driving me to Dublin, it was just a dirt road. It was just nothing. It was just a desert. All I saw was emptiness. I was only 26 years old. It just didn't seem real. I was really frightened. I didn't know if it was strong enough, that if I was loved, it was gonna keep us together as a family. My name is Michael Lewis. I'm sitting here with Adrian Bernard, the sister of Danielle Metz, her daughter, Lanisha metz Heider, and her son, Carl Bernard. Danielle Metz was sentenced to three lives plus 20 years. She's a first-time nonviolent offender. The kind of time she was given is the time that is reserved for serial killers and terrorists. If I wake up in the morning, that's one of the first things that's hit my mind since then. I'm 26 years old now. It's been, it been basically the same. It's been rough, you know, but you know, I pray a lot. You know, I keep faith, things that basically my mother tell me to do. It was hard. It was it was hard growing up. As a young woman, not having your mother around, not having anyone to talk to about your day-to-day -day problems, you know, you had to wait for the phone call. Which is usually only 15 minutes, so you know you had to squeeze everything in, and then 
it's only by the grace of God that I'm here today to tell this story. And, and I just hope that someone out there is listening, that someone out there will help. She's still not home, but I know and I pray to my God that I know justice will be served on her behalf. The growth of the women's prison population has nearly tripled since 1990 and accounts for nearly 30 percent. Chief of law the enforcement officer said today it is time to scale back tough prison terms for low level drug. I've crimes. commuted the sentences of dozens of people sentenced under old drug laws that we now recognize were unfair. And yesterday I announced that. I'm President Obama has reduced more. the prison sentences of 46 non 231 people, the most ever in one day. I know you're happy, girl. If you never make it brown no more, you're here now. Some days, I would just call my mom out of the blue and just tell her, you know, I'm coming home. And even if she didn't believe it, she'd say, oh, I know, boo. I know you're coming. It just felt like a dream that I didn't want to wake up from. When I first came through the door, it felt different. My mom she wasn't cooking anymore. The doctor told me that they had saw something on her cervix, and she saw that I was getting ready to cry, and she said, mm-mm, God's will got to be done, boo. I said, but I ain't gonna be able to make it without you. She said, oh, don't say that. Oh, you gonna make it. Just keep getting up, going to work. You're gonna be all right. I always thought she was going to always be there, no matter what. My mom passed May the 21st. As I was lying there, I just was thinking about the ceiling fan. And, um, I, was, I remember the whole time I was gone, I've never seen a working ceiling fan, I've saw one in a book. So whenever, since I've been home, and whenever I wake up here in this house, I always, you know, that's the first thing I see when I open my eyes, and that lets me know that, you know, I'm really here, because for a minute, I used to think that, am I still there? But I know I didn't see a ceiling fan, so I always, if I, you know, if I stay by my mom's house, and I wake up here, I always make sure that fan is on when I get up in the morning, that lets me know that that I'm actually here. It really just makes me think about time, how time just, you know, don't stop for no one. It just keeps on going and going and going. We're having a conversation in the newsroom, and I don't know if you're aware, 
President Obama granted clemency to Danielle Metz after she served 23 years in prison. Well, I had a good upbringing in New Orleans. I was the youngest of nine. My mom, she worked at Leidenheimer Bacon for 40 years. My dad, he was a cement finisher. I was raised uptown on General Taylor. A good neighborhood. Watching my mama work hard. As a young girl, I guess I just started fantasizing. You know, wanting something, I guess, more than what I had. Now let's rewind a bit here. In the early 90s, Danielle Metz married Glenn Metz, who was dubbed by some as a drug kingpin. The government contends Glenn Metz and his wife Danielle Metz were the leaders of the so-called Metz gang. In sentencing them to life behind bars, Judge McNamara said, narcotics crime is destroying our city and nation. It's some of the things that was important to me while I was in there, like, in this paper right here, I don't know if you guys know, but they had vacated one of my sentences, and the judge said that it didn't really matter because I still had, I still would have two life sentences plus the 20 years. So I was kind of puzzled, like, how could it weigh so much when you're getting sentenced, and then when you deduct it, it don't account for nothing. But I guess when you don't know the law, that's what happened. This one, this is my favorite because I always connect with us being together no matter what. Whether without a husband or dad, it was always going to be us three. That's how I always vision us, envision us together all the time with us as a family. This is him. I named my son after his dad. His name is Carl. I think his first Easter. And, um, and then this was a picture it was my son's birthday, and I asked my mom to give him a party, and I bought him a little motorcycle bike, and he loved it, but he was still happy then. You could kind of see over a period of time how his facial expression changed from happiness, 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 to like, not too happy, not too happy, because I guess the reality of the situation, you know, he was having birthdays, more and more birthdays without me. I had so many memories from the perfect childhood. Spending a lot of time with my mom. I was never away from my mom, like from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep, before the separation. She was my best friend. I, I drew this a long time ago. It's my son, that's my daughter, me and my mom. You see freedom, one happy family, and it's going home. And they say, with God, all things are possible. My son, he wasn't at the airport. And when I didn't see him, I was heartbroken. No, this is just my homecoming, homecoming celebration. Y'all know I've been in prison for 23 years. Y'all didn't know that? I didn't even know that. He had told me he was teaching himself not to feel because I was never coming home.
I don't really remember too much of my mom being in the picture before prison. When my mom went away, I moved with my aunt and my four cousins. We went to LA. And then we moved to Sacramento. And then from Sacramento, we moved to Stockton. And that's where I spent most of my adult life to now. Right now, I'm 29, and I'll be 30 soon. Um, I was about three years old when my mom went to prison. I never really imagined what life would be like with both of my parents home. I never really remembered anything of them being home. In the Bible, it, it had, there's a scripture that said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That, that's a really prominent scripture in my life. So when friends or family or anybody would leave, I know he would be there. My daughter, Victory, I felt like that was a fitting name for her. God gave us victory over every situation. Now that my mom's home, we do get to FaceTime and talk often, and we are trying to get a better relationship. I wish she would come and stay up this way because you can't really get to know somebody when they're far away. You can talk. We've been talking for years because we don't really know each other as well as we think we do. The dream I had of us being together, the thing that I visioned, it wasn't my reality once I came back to New Orleans. I'm just trying to figure this whole freedom thing out. What's my purpose? I would always just tell my mother about my plans I'm going to be a mentor, and I'm going to help all these girls that I leave behind uh, that are still here. And she would just say, mm-hmm, boo. Good morning, good morning. How y'all doing? So what, what y'all did for the week? Tell me what happened for the week. Uh, they just gave me six months at the city. So, so when I'm up here, I'm going to get through the night like that. Are you? So how you feel about that? What I tell you? Huh? I'm sorry? No, I'm talking about for us. Start planning now for oh. when you get out, because you're going to get out. You're not going to be sitting in there like I was sitting in there and not knowing what's, ha what's going on. And how are you? What are your plans for the future? I don't have any right now. You still with your boyfriend? No, I have a new one. How old is he? 32. How old are you? I'm 15. 15. I thought so. I know at the age of 15, 16, I wasn't in a life of crime, but when I met somebody, and that became my lifestyle. If you change your thinking, you'll change your behavior. He Eliminate them out your life. Oh, he going to rehab too? He's only going to rehab. But we ain't worried about him. Like, we kind of concentrate yeah, I'm going on to rehab. Okay, so you got to worry about yourself. Yeah. No, you she was there, but she just didn't want to come out. When I met my husband, I was 18 and he was 32. Oh, my mom was like, he's going to take your youth away from you. I didn't understand what she meant.
Love hate relationship with New Orleans because of what happened to me. You know, I was really mad for a long time. My son's father, he died when my son was six months old. He was murdered by the New Orleans police. And I was really like devastated. Now I have a baby. I was 18, and it's like, how am I gonna take care of this child? I met my husband through a friend. She was like, girl, I saw this dude at the second line. It was all there, had on their mink clothes and Rolex watches. And so I was like, who was that? She said, girl, they said it was Glenn. He was almost like invisible. You heard about him, but you never got to see him. You could never say, that's him over there. He asked me where I had been all his life. I was so immature, and I was 18 years old. He was 32. I started feeling kind of special, like I was the one that he chose to talk to. And he was like, this, this is how your life gonna be. And I said, what you mean? He said, plenty for you, not gonna ever want for nothing. That's all I ever wanted, was to be able to take care of my son. Tonight, ringleader Glenn Metz and 13 other key players in the organization have been indicted by the federal grand jury on 54 separate counts. I met Danielle in beauty school uptown in 1985. And it's so funny how uptown is, everyone knew everybody. Like, all our parents kind of knew each other. I think most of all my finest memories was what you kind of like, growing up from that small, like we always got into it with somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Danielle was very boy crazy. A boy could look at it and she look, tell you, I look, cause he like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he he looking. <laughs> that boy like me. That's right. <laughs> when Carol was born, she said, he ugly. How he look? I said, Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you know why that? she said that? Because she said, my baby wasn't the most attractive baby. She I'll wasn't. never forget that either. She <laughs> was. <laughs> <laughs> and so then after that, you decided to go to beauty school? Was it after you had Carl? After I had Carl, because now I got to do something. I got to, you know, I have my son. I had to do something. Like, OK, if I go to school, then I won't have to worry about all that. Now, I don't know if y'all remember, but six months later. Six months later, uh, Carol's father was uh, murdered by um, the, the policeman. Police. It was hard. We all were young. And I think my personal opinion, uh, through that, her vulnerability led her more towards her husband, Glenn Mitz. And then there goes the story of Danielle and her journey that led her to that sentence. I just knew that was going to be a road to where it ended up. I, um, I, I never disapproved of their relationship. He, you know, like, he would fight her, you know, but, I mean, I didn't know it was serious until it was too late. Like, when she was going to court, it was a joke. I thought that we was gonna all walk out the courthouse together. I never in a million years would have dreamed that she would have got a life sentence. Three life sentences in 20 years. Sometimes I feel bad, because I, I didn't think she was ever coming home. We all did. You know, used to write letters. They were so consistent. 
until, you know, I'm coming home. When I come home, do this. I'm going to come home. And she's doing everything. <laughs> my friends really don't understand what my life is like. I had never saw my mom cry before. And my mom was like, I don't think you know what just happened to you. Do you know you have life? Do you have life? Do you know what that means? This call is from a federal prison. So many nights, so many people screaming and yelling. Something has happened at home. He had to restrain her. He hogged tied her. Shackled. Body slammed. I would see women contemplating suicide. Y'all know my body was there, my mind didn't have to be there. My spirit was not going to be there. I wasn't going to lose my sanity. After being in prison for 18 years, I decided to work that Unicorn call center. That's where the 411 calls came in. The federal system uses inmates for outsourcing. We would sit at cubicles. It was like a nine to five. City and state, please. We had to stay on less than a minute. City and state, please, may I have your listing? And I didn't want to work there before because it was almost like slave labor. They was playing us like maybe 69 cents an hour. May I have your listing? But after I got over there, it gave me like an escape. That was my connection to the outside world. Once I log off, take my headset off, now you have officers escorting us. We have to get in line and, you know, get our bags searched, move through the metal detectors. Now you're going back into the prison part of it. People would ask me, well, how, do you, how can you do this every day? The women who I built a sisterhood, but they helped me do my time. We become as close as mothers, daughters, sisters. I've been in there 23 years, so I've been with them just as long as I've been with my real family. We were fantasized about being home all the time. And everybody would be by my mother's house on a Sunday. She would have, like, smothered chicken, shrimp and okra. Miss Pat, who was my roommate, she was like, oh, girl, I could just taste that now. Right. Oh, yes, Danny. You remember that, Danny? I wish I had have been able to come and see your mother before she passed, because I knew she could cook, and you know how I love to eat, too, just right. like you. Right. We both greeted. We both greeted. <laughs> yep. Because I did my time. My body was there, but my mind was very seldom there. And I prayed myself up out of there, too. You got in your word, didn't you? Yes, I did. Prayed your way up out of there, too, because prayer works. So, Danny, tell me about the kids. I just want to hear. Well, you know, Miss Pat, I still feel guilty about, you know, not being here uh, all those years. And sometimes when I can't get to where they are right away, it makes me sad. And one thing about the children... I know. You can't allow them to hold you hostage to what has happened. And I know things have gone different ways with your son. My son did the same thing. They missed us, sweetheart. Even though they are adults now, they're still suffering. All you can do is pick up since you've been home. You can only start now. Please join me in welcoming Danielle Metz and Carmen James Randolph. So, Danielle, let's go back to the 1990s. Janet Jackson was singing, That's the Way Love Goes. When you were a young mother, introduce us to who Danielle was at that time. 
It's ironic that you would say Janet Jackson because that's who I wanted to be. <laughs> that's who I really thought I was back in the day. She is my favorite of all after Beyonce. Now, <laughs> my mom would come and even when I get ready to cry or I get, you know, we get at the table and we have our little talks, she would always tell me, she said, boo, ain't no sense in crying. You did what you wanted to do. She said, so we just gonna sit here and eat these chicken wings and we not gonna even worry about that because if you get to crying, I'm gonna leave. She said, all you got to do is have a little faith. My mom was a realist and I had two kids that I had to be responsible for, my son and my daughter. Both of them have never given me a problem the whole time I've been in prison. That says a lot because the statistics say is that they probably end up in prison themselves. Me and my son was riding, right? And he was telling me he wouldn't hang on the corner. And I told him, I said, why? I said, they just hanging out. He said, that's just not me. And I said, oh, okay. Right after we was talking about it, somebody ended up getting killed on the corner. So he said, see, man, that's why you wouldn't catch me around nothing like that, you know? I said, I would have been scared. And he said, what you mean? I said, because I ain't never had a gun before. I never shot a gun. I never possessed a gun. He said, what? He said, man, come on now. I said, no. So he needed to know that because whatever he was hearing or whatever people told him, he thinking I'm one way and I'm another way. So that's why I need to tell my own story other than let somebody else tell it for me. And it kind of broke my heart. I'm like, well, who do you think I am? I remember just being by my grandmother watching Richard Pryor stand up. He was like, man, I met a guy that had triple life. How bad were you? My brother, his name was Jabo. He was doing a sentence, triple life. <laughs> How in the f do you do triple life? I mean, I mean, if he die and come back, he got to go to penitentiary. It was early in the morning, like when the federal agents kicked down the door, put guns to me and my grandparents and tear the whole house up, like literally, like beds, cutting mattresses and opening up cabinets, really like ramshack and everything, like breaking TVs. Where is my mom? Do you know how long she's gonna be gone? Do you know exactly it is where she at? My first time seeing her, drew the glass, you know, it gave me an understanding of what really was going on somewhat. You know, not to the extent as far as what length of time or things of that nature, but okay, she's in jail. The government contends Glenn Metz and his wife were the bosses of a highly structured organization that employed the other defendants on trial as hitmen, drug distributors, and collectors. Danielle asked me to take her kids. She didn't want them in New Orleans, and she knew family and friends would be talking about everything that happened, and she just wanted the kids away from that noise. For the first two years, Carl stayed with me. And when he turned nine, he asked his mom to move back to New Orleans with his paternal grandmother. I relocated to Northern California, which was about 45 minutes from where Danielle was housed for her to have an opportunity to have a relationship with her daughter. On visiting day, we got there about 7.45-ish. We will just sit in that visiting shed and try to compact everything that happened in that week, uh, main events, things that were missed in that one sitting. We would cry, laugh, sing, do all kinds of stuff, tell jokes. You know, I try to keep the strong face on for my mom so she didn't have to worry about me being emotional. My, my brother, for the most part, he would cry a lot, but I would try to comfort him and tell him, it's going to be OK. On family day, they allow you to actually, like, go into the facilities. Man, it had basketball. I always get mad that she will beat me because I thought that I could beat her at everything. She would not let me win. She'll let me get super, super close. And then she just come with just like this special move. And you're having so much fun, you're with your mom. Things really like seem somewhat normal because you're back with your mom. So, but like every other hour, you would just look at the clock. And as the time go, it's just getting more sad and more sad as the time passes. So about time, like it gets to like 2.45, you go sit on your mom lap, you go to hugging and stuff like that. And that would really like hit me every single time. I would just blank out and just really like, damn, this really you like this. It's really your life. 
And last day, we would have to almost pry him away from his mother. Imagine being six, seven years old, really thinking that you may not see your mom like ever again as a free person. It, it made me like not really like have feelings. To this day, I try to work on that to fail, like to fail things. My question since a kid w was always was like, what would be the best for me? You know, how could I really like be in my best state of mind, be the best person that I possibly would be with the circumstances really like being with the circumstances being as it's pertaining to, you know, my mom or whatnot. So yeah. Yeah, peace is everything to me. Driving is soothing. You know, anything for me to um to soothe my mind, I do it. So no radio, no nothing, no company, just riding. I always was a loner. That's one of the things that I think I needed to just stay just focused. It was just too heavy on me, just me trying to process everything. When she came home, like, you know, as happy as I was, my soul was just exhausted. You know, you're trying for her and for yourself as well to be something that you haven't been for the last 33 years of your life. I miss her. I miss her, and sometimes I just feel like I'm out there by myself. Like, you know, my son them was in a book called Alone in the World, and every time I think about it, I be like, well, that's what I am, alone in the world, just me, myself, and I, riding down the street by myself. I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, other people think that, you know, like when you're in prison, or just saying that all that I'm overcome, like you still don't have life everyday issues. They'll say, well, you ought to be glad you're home. Just worry about you being home, but there's a lot come with that. It's not just you being home. You still have to deal with your emotions, your struggles, your progress. It's still a process. And I know I'm far from perfect, you know, but I'm trying and I'm making all the effort to be the best example I could be to my kids, to the community, to my mom, to my nephews, to all of the young girls in the past that probably knew Danielle when I was out there in the world. Just be a good example. This is our house. This is where we stayed right here. I'm just glad that, you know, you had somewhere to stay while I was in prison and stuff. Yeah, Auntie did a wonderful job raising you guys and just bringing y'all into a good environment and having somewhere that you can, you know, a place that you can call home. This house right here is where one of my boyfriends used to stay. <laughs> One of your boyfriends. You ain't had no boyfriend. Yes, I did. Oh, you did? <laughs> I forgot to write you about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Hey! Oh, the pump. Does she have a toy or anything in there? Never under the pumpkin. Thank you. I ate Chinese food. 
Victor was just like, strain me. <laughs> Uh, hey, I did give her a little iced tea, though. I said, Mama, I cannot trust her with you. No, you can't. That's caffeine. Baby does not go no. tea like that. No, no, oh, no. my God. Babies can't have tea, Nisha. Mama. A little tea, unsweet iced tea. And uh, what else did I give her? Now that my mom's home, it's like, Mom, I'm not a kid anymore. You know, she wants to tell me, oh, you don't need to do this, or she wants to tell me how to raise my child, and I'm like, no, Mama. That's my granny puppy. No. That's but puppy. sometimes I am puppy. fearful as a mother because I don't really know how to be a mother. And I've never seen a mother figure. I had my aunt, but I didn't have a mom. So a lot of times I'm praying and winging it Look, 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 look. When I walk in and I see my mom here with victory, sometimes I have to pinch myself. I still can't believe it. I wish she would come and stay up this way. She's pretty busy and going back to school and trying to get her life back on track. Ooh, you running laps, girl. Run. Team, today we'll be doing our collective canvas in the Century City Target area. Then, yeah, Miss will be taking the lead. Let's go on by the Project Food Store first, you know, by the Magnolia, the Melphamine. That's our Target area. Anything going on today? You staying out of trouble, huh? Yeah. All right, what I told you? Stay good, stay worthy, stay out of trouble. She has served as an advocate and mentor, Danielle Max. So when the judge gave me life, he told me I had forfeited my right to live in a humane society. He was going to make me out an example for anybody that wished to follow in my footsteps. We all have a past, and a lot of us are not proud of things that we have done in the past. But it is not going to do us any good to stay focused on it. Our name is going to go farther than our faces ever will. So use this as a luncheon pad. And thank you, and have a great day. Me becoming a mentor and working every day and going to school, it's therapeutic for me. It is a loneliness inside. I have to keep moving. I have to keep going to not think about it. Hi, are you making a, an appointment for the Fit Clinic? When was your release date? And yeah, we treat for everything. Hey, Mr. Dave, how you doing? You know, coming out of prison, people don't realize how important healthcare is on the inside, but I know when I was in there, you rarely ever got treated for anything. Is that how it was when you was at? Last year, I was just employed at Cure Violence, formerly Ceasefire. Now I'm the formerly incarcerated transition community health worker under Tulane University. Um, I'm still attending school. I'm just using my story as a vehicle to change things. Come here, girl. That's my little niece. <laughs> You chilling? I got a pass by my auntie house. You know that's my auntie who told on me. I know. The one with the I blind know, I know that. Angela Bernard wove a spellbinding tale of the Mets organization and its profits. She recounted how her nephew, Glenn Metz, recruited her in 1987 to count money for the alleged gang. I know how much my mom loved her sister. That was her baby sister, my aunt. The one person that I trusted. I never think that it would come to that, but it did. Bernard testified she and Danielle Metz often traveled to Houston with thousands of dollars concealed in a specially built station wagon for Colombian drug dealers to pack with cocaine. She and I, we would go out of town from New Orleans to Houston. In my mind, I put it like I wasn't going to do anything illegal, which I knew it was illegal. We had a lot of tension in the house. Sometimes he would hit me. Like, I didn't want no problems with him. I didn't want to argue with him or nothing. So I kind of initiated it. Not kind of, I initiated He didn't ask me to do anything for him. I volunteered. I said, well, if you, don't, you, know, if you need somebody to do something for you, then I'll do it. You know, like, I figure I'm his wife. You know, like, I'm here. You know, that was my thinking then. 
okay, I'll do it, or whatever you need me to do. Now, I'm, I didn't think he would take me up on it, but that's what happened. When you're in that kind of relationship, that's something you really hide that you don't want nobody to know. It cost me my life. They were so small, and every visit, they were getting taller and bigger and bigger. Christmas was the hardest time for me, but at the end of the visit, we would always, everybody bow their heads. Next Christmas, your mom is gonna be home. Sometimes I try to just push it out of my mind like it's not really the holiday season. Carl says, oh man, I'm so happy that I'm not on my way to visit you in prison. And I was like, huh? And he was like, you know, we'll be on our way up there right now if you weren't home, and Granny would be telling us how to behave, make sure my daughter's not upset. I said, I don't even want to think about it. I didn't know if I was happy or sad. Just like now, nah, I still don't know if I'm happy or I'm sad. You know, holidays, you know, you look to spend it with your family, and I wish I can go back and start from when they were seven years old and just have plans and say, this is what we're going to do. But Carl, he kind of introverted person. He don't, you know, he do his own thing. My daughter, she's going somewhere else for Christmas with her other side of the family or somewhere in another city, another state. I always think and ask myself, am I supposed to be here? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Is this where God want me at now? <laughs> What's up, baby? Danny! Who would ever thought, huh? Wow. <laughs> Oh, my God, you look like a model. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> you look good. Right. I love your hair and everything. When I was in prison, when people would say, how long have you been in prison, a lot of the time I would just be like, this long. <laughs> but I was down to here. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. Have you ever been to Arkansas? The only thing I know about Arkansas is President Clinton and you. <laughs> I'm just well, here is what I call the war room. Oh, my yeah. God. And that's just a small percentage, because I just wanted to help women. For a long time, you know, that's all I did. I just did you women, knowing that we were mostly just in there because of what a husband or boyfriend did. So it started off real small, and then I finally just said, oh, screw it. I'll just, you know, let's just help everybody. But it has me spread so thin, because I don't, I don't really have the infrastructure. But do you, here's all of, here's all of us that were together. So yeah, you and yeah. American and Angie, and sometimes we'd all be in the law library yeah. together. This is unbelievable that the odds, the David and Goliath element to this story, that we're sitting here trying to understand the law to defend ourselves up against, you know, Goliath. I always thought you was going home anyway. You know, you, you was the typical candidate, green eyes, Blind hair. I just thought that you would always go home. That's just how, you know, the skills it's are. It's kind of sad in a way, isn't it, though? Yeah, but it's that's sad. the way it is. It is sad. My own sentence was commuted by President Clinton in 2000. I felt like what was so important with my own case is exposure. What do we need to do to bring women out of prison so that they have a presence out here in the collective consciousness of society? I married a successful businessman, and he believed in the medicinal properties of MDMA. He was embarking on a business venture, basically, to have it manufactured. I had peripheral 
exposure that sucked me into the conspiracy statute, which means if you do one thing, you're guilty for everything that everybody else has done. So I was sentenced in 92 to 24 years to FCI Dublin. I'm witnessing all these other women who are in the same situation as I was, who just had peripheral involvement due to their relationship to a husband or boyfriend. The whole prison experience for me was as much as I hate to admit it, um, it's where I found my purpose. And I feel like we were given an education. You learn everything about going to trial, and then when you're done, you're like, well, I won't get an opportunity to do that again. Right. But now I know everything I would have done different. Well, now you're an expert. You're right. an expert on so many things in policy and uh, with regard to prison reform and then also sentencing reform and clemency. A lot of times, I wonder if I'm spinning my wheels, if I'm making a difference. Is it gonna matter what happened with me? Is it gonna give somebody else a second chance? I think it was like 1993. Me and Clint moved to Vegas. We got into an argument. It got physical and I waited till um, he left. But this time I wrote a letter and said I was leaving. I wasn't coming back. But it was too late. When the indictment came out, I realized that, hey, I am wanted by the FBI. I went to Mississippi. I think it was like five months. I would psych myself out like, you know, this was gonna be my new life but I knew I couldn't be on a run forever by myself. I knew at some point I was gonna be separated from my kids for a long time. I just started imagining my life, what it would have been had it not come to this. Why didn't I tell somebody what I was going through? Maybe somebody could have helped me. Why didn't I get out sooner? It was breaking my heart. I was like, I just hope it hurry up and come to an end. If they come and find me, just come on, find me. Fugitive Danielle Metz, wife of drug kingpin Glenn Metz, was arrested Saturday at an apartment building in Jackson, Mississippi. I'm sure he thought that I would testify against him. I'm sure he thought that the way we left off, that, oh, she's going to, you know, since this happened, she's going to do that to me. But I just couldn't bring myself to do it to him. The prosecutor turned it around. The story that they were painting, that I was his second in command, I was a shot caller as well. That wasn't true. I got found guilty on possession to distribute cocaine, money laundering. I was sentenced under a kingpin statue. That made all the difference. Over the years, I would just reach out to different advocacy groups. They couldn't do anything for me. They told me that my case was too high profile and that it was too complicated. I was just spinning my wheels that I probably would never get out. President Clinton has used his clemency powers rarely when compared to his predecessors. There was just a common thread of non-controversial commutations. When I met Danielle in August 2000, I really believed that at some point that she was going to be freed. You need to get political support because it's a political decision. And Danielle's prosecutor wasn't convinced that Danielle Metz was a battered wife. She was going to oppose Danielle getting clemency. There was the public story that Danielle had punched Glenn Metz in the courtroom after the guilty verdict. She seemed, for some reason, amazed by the verdict. I'm just, she started beating on him? That's correct. She seemed to see, uh, to beat on her husband and start attacking him with her shackles. Of course I was mad. I just, you know, I, I was shocked. You know, I didn't know how I was gonna react. And I'm sure he didn't know how I was gonna react. He, he didn't move or he didn't say, well, why are you hitting me? Or, I guess he was surprised too, you know, but people don't know. You can't get mad with people for not knowing. Sometimes we don't know how to get out of those situations, you know, because us as women, we want to be loved. It might be in a wrong way, but we want to be loved, you know, so 
They don't know. They really don't know. They have no clue. I told her that, I, look, I'm not going to forget about you, but commuting these drug cases wasn't going to be the direction the new incoming administration would have towards clemency. Solemnly swear. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. I was still there after so long, decades after decades, calendar new after count. calendar, year after year. New counts going on. Go. The scene is nothing short of apocalyptic. Missing every highlight of every event of everything of your kid's life. How am I going to get out this place? I've commuted the sentences of dozens of people sentenced under old drug laws that we now recognize were unfair. And yesterday I announced that I'm commuting dozens more. We sent a letter to Kenneth Polite, who is appointed by President Obama, the U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Louisiana. This is the potential key that's going to open that prison door. He agreed to write a long letter on her behalf. Ms. Metz has now spent almost half her life in prison. And we do not believe that she merits spending the rest of her life in prison. Nor do we believe that she poses any meaningful risk to public safety. Accordingly, my office supports President Obama granting Ms. Metz's application for a commutation of sentence. Respectfully submitted, Kenneth Pulley Jr., United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Louisiana. Everyone agreed that this was, if not the most worthy, then certainly a worthy candidate for a commutation consideration. Danielle was charged essentially under a kingpin statute uh, in, at the time of her indictment and trial. Uh, all of the evidence in the case uh, suggests that she certainly was not that, that the charge itself was not an appropriate one. She does not need to spend another day in prison. It had started to play on my mind like so many people was leaving and I was still there after so long. Nobody told me anything, but in my spirit, I just started packing all my things. A friend of mine came to my room and she was like, what you doing? I said, I'm leaving here. Leaving, where you going? I was like, I'm going home. And I went to the gospel show that night and I was sitting in the back of the church and they were talking about a breakthrough. And that was the sermon, like the beginning of the end, and this is when you're gonna have a new life. I was so drained and weary and just tired of, tired of being there. I just cried and cried and cried and cried all that night. I cried like never before, and I prayed and I cried and I prayed and I cried. And when I woke up that morning and I got up, to start my day, it felt like a weight had been lifted off of me, like I was just free. I think it was like a day or two days later, I heard my lawyer voice on the phone. He was like, Danielle, you're gonna be going home. Oh my God. And when he said that, I just screamed like I never screamed before. I guess all the pain that I've ever, all the stuff that I was bottling up all them years that I couldn't cry when my mom came, I just dropped the phone. <laughs> I love you, baby. Mama! Hey! Who said? Hey! Crazy! All right. Let me see. What you crying for? You're home now. All the crying is over. All the good times gonna start for me and you. Why are you crying? Aren't you happy? Oh. <laughs> Hello? Hey, Miss Daniel. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm fine. Um, I know your mama had told you a little bit about me. And I had been talking to your brother, um, just, you know, telling him um, basically that I want to try to assist with uh, getting your mother home. Absolutely. Your mom was a very integral part of my life in prison. And I just recently got another job. And this organization centered around 
ending the incarceration of women and girls. That is the mission. And so the first person I thought about was your mother. Thank you, Miss Dan. Well, I hope it's fit. Cause remember, uh, to I know that right. God did it for you, it I'm eyes. definitely believing that He's going to do it for my mother as well. And that, like, that makes me feel so excited and happy because we are making steps towards her being liberated. It's a lot of work to be done, and you know, I don't, I can't give you any false hope. But as long as you know I'm doing something and I'm keeping Miss Pam name alive, yeah, that means that hey, we bringing awareness to her. And just seeing you here, it, it's kind of taking me somewhere because I'm thinking about my daughter. Yeah. So if you don't mind me just asking you, uh, how, how do it feel? Because I, I don't, I, I've asked Glenisha sometimes, but sometimes I can't bring myself to, I'd rather pretend like I'm here now, that's all you need to worry about. Mm -hmm. But I know it's something that is not that easy for her because I've been absent yeah. for all that time. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, if my mom came home, I want to have that conversation because you have to take my feelings in consideration as far as, like, how I feel and why I've been emotionally scorned by, you know, my mother's absence. In some conversations, sad as it may be, some conversations can be had between you and your daughter because of the sake of the, you know, relationship, you know, and to be honest, because... From a daughter's perspective, if I really, really told you how I felt, you know, with how I feel about my my mother being absent, it probably it would hurt her real, real bad. And you know, it's like that's not my goal, you know. Right. And by me expressing that to you, what justice is it really going to do? But I also want to be transparent and tell you, hey, I felt this affected me, but you know. I don't want to have to, you know, go in too deep into the conversation because, like I said, some things is better left unsaid. Today, I'm going to be speaking, standing in solidarity with my friends who's campaigning and advocating for people that we left behind. So we're here trying to get the new administration to change the policies, to recognize that we are human beings. And at the end of the day, how much time is enough time? Like, when is enough? You know, prison is about rehabilitation. Well, there ain't no harm in your mind. Come on. Stand on freedom. You know there ain't no harm. Oh, no. Stay on freedom. I said there ain't no harm. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls is committed to abolishing incarceration for women and girls. When we started this battle for clemency under President Obama's administration, we fought like hell. We were able to assist in bringing 50 of our sisters out of the depths of incarceration. Many of those sisters were serving life with no parole. I invite to say a few words to you, our own dear Danielle Metz. That's right. Danielle was the last sister that we were able to push out before that administration ended. Danielle Metz. Yeah. Free her. Free her. Free her. Free her. We have a lot of work to do, but this is a small feat for our president. A very small fee, because he don't have to go to the Supreme Court. That's right. He don't have to go to Congress. The power is in the presidency. I know what it feels like to be separated from a family. I know how it feels sitting in a fetus position. 
begging and pleading with God, give me one more chance. I am home, but I am not free. I am not free because my sisters are not free. Free her, free her, free her, free her, free her, free her, free her. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, Andrea. How you doing? Morning, Danny. Good to see you. I was calling because I wanted to discuss Miss Pam Tyler, the lady that uh, I told you that I did time with in Dublin. Yes. Unfortunately, President Biden has not acted upon our request to release 100 women. In Miss Pam's case, I think that we're really going to have to engage with Catherine and our legal division to make a determination as to what other inroads we can take legally to try and reduce her sentence or to get compassionate release or to do something other than uh, just hanging our hat on clemency. Okay. Um, I know that um, Ms. Catherine was talking about the students. So do you think I should, uh, the students that are going to be working on different cases, uh, would that be okay with you if I submit that to, you know, uh, Ms. Catherine and start I the process? I think that's... Yes, I think that's best next steps um, in this in this uh, case. That um, and I think it would be a great case for the students. Our cases are very complicated. You know, we don't ever want to go back and revisit that stuff. The women on the inside, they don't know the first thing to do to start getting help, and a lot of times they feel like they're forgotten about. There's a heaviness that hangs over women's prisons. Right. You can very easily feel like you're going to get lost in that system, even if you have an out date. You know, our work also is to call these things into question. When you're in prison and you can't educate yourself, it's easy for you to go back to the things that nagged you down. But when you're you educated... You know, what kind of country takes a young mother like you were with two babies at home and come up with a sentence that isn't just a life sentence, but three life sentences, we have to really pause. We have to really ask ourselves, what are we doing here as the most incarcerated country on the planet? What is the expected outcome? When this country incarcerates black women, their entire family suffers, resulting in long-term destabilization and intergenerational trauma. And we must do everything we can to dismantle this carceral system. Free her. You talked to your grandma today? Uh, two days ago. Oh. Two days ago. She back? She home? Yeah, she made it. She was, she was, uh, she made it. I called her, she was asleep. She was just getting up. I went out or whatever, yeah, so she made it back, the house back in order. I told you I'm gonna be on probation, huh? Soon, huh? And walked you it down. Remember I was telling you about your five-year plan? And he was like, five years? I'm like, my, five years? Like, look. Ooh, I'm so happy. Go. Five I'm years. I'm so happy, baby. I'm be getting on the plane. Well, you already been on the planes. Planes. Yep. Like now they're going west. All these different places I went to. Exactly. All the way from Dublin to here to there to there to that. I ain't done yet. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's dope. I'm just really, like, happy to be able to just really, like, see you, you know, just coming to your own and just really, like, seeing, like, how you is really, like, what humanity as a whole, like, you just give and do things for other people and be a certain way. I think that was something for me to really see. Mm -hmm. You know, like, just the action of it. Not you saying it, which you never said it, but you're just really doing it. Mm -hmm. Really, like, I think that was something that, uh, that I really needed to see. Okay, 
My kids feel very close to my mom. Wait, wait, wait. Seeing them with my mom is a little bittersweet. You love Granny? Give Granny a hug. Come here, give me a hug. Give me a hug. Tell them who you love. I just started talking to a therapist and trying to get counseling. Talking about our problems. That's kind of like a taboo topic. We don't talk about our issues. We just try to push through and survive and maneuver around them. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Granny. Happy birthday to you. Sometimes looking at my kids kind of reminds me of where my life could have been. Yay! Victory just turned four. I was just turning four when my mom went in. Who won't kick it? Oh, that's too big for them. Oh, no. I thought this was the gem. No, no, Victory, you got one. It's bittersweet. Hmm. Hello? Hey, Miss Mitch. Hey, what's going on? Oh, my goodness, you would not believe. They just said that my mother is going to be released on the 29th. So I need to go down there, get a flight so I can pick her up from the airport. Yes. Oh, my God, I am so happy for you. Miss Pam, you're going to believe this one right here. The 29th of July? The 29th of July, she'd be able to come home. Having you on this journey to help us and to see it finally come to pass, like, Ooh, it's not like I can breathe again. Team Pam. Team Pam. <laughs> High five. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. This is so surreal. Oh, my goodness. Ooh. It must be coming. I see those flags. Acting like America is America. Baby, please. Oh, I hate this place. I ain't lying. That truck is the truck that watch the institution. It, it rides all the way around all the time. Mm. Just keep riding around, riding around. I guess for security purposes, whatever that might be. Right. It ain't like who gonna jump over a fence? Do these Superman? Right. Did she say she was coming she out? She's in the van. Oh. She said her first thing she just saw. She said, ah! she, she got the picture. We was in the wrong spot. You all right? It's over now, like my mama told me, it's over now.
the dynamic of a mother and daughter relationship, it could be a little difficult at times. Sometimes I'm not used to certain comments or expectations. See how Merz one step at a time. It's one step at a time. How come Merz? It's on both sides that we both have expectations of one another that probably aren't being met. If you've been out of somebody like 23 years, that's how long it probably take to get things back to normal. Two people getting to know each other all over again. It's just, uh, it, it's a lot. I know you've been through things, things that I don't know about, but I'm very proud of you. I'm proud of the mother you are. I'm proud of the daughter you are. And I might not say it to you all the time, but anybody that know me know how I feel about my kids. You are, Carrie, have never disappointed me. No matter what, what I thought of, when we have our bad days, I'm always proud of you, and I'm just thankful to God that Whatever you go through, if you need me, I'm here. A mother is the foundation of the family. But because of the choices I made, it was derailed. And, 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 and that's one thing that I really admire, that your daughters won't have to go through that because of decisions and the way that you live your life. I can't go back and change anything. You know, all I can do is be the best person that I can be now. I know I could have done some things different. And maybe the outcome would have been different. We can't get back none of that time. The time is gone. And if we could build from here, I'm here. And so, you know, I'm just thankful. Danielle. Congratulations on your graduation from Southern. I'm so proud of you. I'm confident that your example will have a positive impact on others who are looking for a second chance. Tell your children I say hello and know that I'm rooting for all of you. Sincerely, Barack Obama. I have a purpose in life and now I'm evolving. I'm sort of like that rose from concrete. When you're incarcerated, it's nothing but a whole lot of steel, metal, and bricks. The wall is just the wall. It can be broken down. When I'm fighting for the women that's still inside, I'll tell them that it's just the wall. It can be broken down. Beautiful, simply gorgeous. My mother would be ecstatic, ecstatically happy, as I'm sure she is. She would be saying, don't cry, Danielle. She would be like, what you crying for, boo? What you crying for, boo? She didn't believe in tears. She's like, you just do what you got to do. trying to break the ceiling now. I'm on my life mission.
it was just going back into a, a place that I really wanted to forget, but I had to dig inside of myself to be as transparent as I could be. I had never saw my mom cry before. And my mom was like, I don't think you know what just happened to you. Do you know you have life? Do you know what that means? This call is from a federal prison. We wanted to make the film about a woman who made a choice and the repercussions of that choice. Danielle Metz was sentenced to three lives plus 20 years. She's a first time nonviolent offender. It's very much about facing these injustices, facing the wrongs that were done to you, and then when you get a second chance, what do you do with it? This is a personal film, it's a lyrical film, it's poetic, it's emotional. I had been in prison so long, I'm like, I just want to throw that in a sea of forgetfulness and just, you know, like, move on with my life. But that would always be a part of my life. With me expressing the pain and revisiting it, I begin to heal from it. I knew that we wanted to approach the storytelling in a way that hadn't been before, and we owe Danielle that. And when we think about the large conversations that we have about prison reform, it's often men, black men that we see. And it is women like Danielle and those women that she was in prison with. Those stories get lost. There's this dehumanization that, we, that Danielle is speaking to allows for sweeping, sweeping sentences that are insurmountable lengths of time to be granted to people without a real consideration of what that means. And in Danielle's case, the jury was given erroneous sentencing recommendations. You're missing everything of your kid's life. How am I going to get out this place? If you've been out of somebody like 23 years, that's how long it probably take to get things back to normal. Louisiana have the highest rate of incarceration and the highest rate of wrongly convicted. It's never going to end. What are we doing? What are we doing? We only bringing more damage and harm to society. I didn't ever want to lose hope. So I always kept thinking about my children and like, I have to make it back there. It makes people feel hopeless when you're steady telling them that they're worth nothing, they're never going to get out. This is all their life going to come to. When I first came through the door, it felt different. It was very hard, but when I came home and I would see this glitter in my mom's eyes, and she was just happy to see me walk through the house, it's still hard. But I'm still trying to connect every day. You know, some days it's not a good day. And when I come off my trips, my son, I tell him sometimes, I just want to get in his arms and cry like a little baby. And he said, what happened? I said, well, I went out here and this happened or that happened. But he was like, you're OK. He said, sometimes you just have to, you know, breathe, breathe. Our audience is the incarcerated, the formerly incarcerated, the family and loved ones of those who are incarcerated. I feel like Danielle is an extraordinary person. And so all the things that she has achieved since coming home, I think it will just help up uplift people and to think about what they can do upon their return and what their family member can do or how they can help navigate them through uh, their transition into the free world. And so I hope this film speaks to them and lets them know that they're not forgotten and that their voice and their story doesn't need to be boxed into one one style of filmmaking or one style of storytelling. I'm so grateful. You, you don't know how grateful I really am. I can't even put it into words. And hopefully we can start changing these things about, you know, around incarceration. The sky is the limit for me. And that's where I'm going. I'm trying to break the ceiling now. <laughs> <laughs>